Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for today's Pearson Speaker Series event with Professor Sebastian Galliani. Uh, my name is Joshua Charles, and I am a second year Master of Public Policy candidate and Pearson Fellow at the Harris School of Public Policy. I'm excited to welcome you all to this event where we will have the opportunity to learn about challenges in stabilizing Argentina's economy. Uh, within the last year, I've taken the initiative to learn more about the individual and the collective realities in Latin America. <clears throat> That's been great. I traveled to Lima, Peru, uh, where I learned extensively about the armed conflicts between the government of Peru and the Maoist guerrilla group Shining Path. Even more recently, for the Pearson Institute in the last few weeks, I had the privilege to learn about Colombia's political apparatus through the lens of two experts in their respective fields. In this conversation, I was exposed to information about the current Colombian government with particular reference to its security and peacekeeping. Regardless of the different realities in Peru and Colombia, their macroeconomic conditions and lead to a larger challenge in Latin America, which is that economic stabilization is not a simple process and rather is permeated with substantive complexities that must be considered in the solution development process. Argentina is no exception in this regard. Fortunately, we have a seasoned economist with us today who is well equipped to discuss Argentina's economy, which I believe will enable us to assess the country's reality in an objective manner and further prompt the creation of, of innovative and sustainable economic solutions. Without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce our guest for this afternoon, Dr. Sebastian Galliani. He is the professor of economics at the University of Maryland. He obtained his PhD in economics from the University of Oxford and works broadly in the field of economics. He is also a fellow of the NBER and Brett. Uh, Dr. Galliana Galliani was Secretary of Economic Policy for the Deputy Minister for the Ministry of Treasury in Argentina between January of 2017 and June of 2018. Dr. Galliani is the, is the associate editor of the Journal of Development Economics, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, and Latin American Economic Review. Further, his work has been featured in Science, the Enver Digest, The Economist, The New York Times, and many other newspapers and magazines around the world. He received the, the Comex Diploma in Development Economics, he has also worked as a consultant for Gates Foundation, the United Nations, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and several governments across the world. On behalf of the Pearson Institute, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sebastian Galliani. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And as uh, it was say, uh, I serve uh, for a year and a half uh, in the government I'm going to be talking about. So that's part of a disclosure. I was also told uh, that I have to make a show. And that was the year and a half where the economic outcomes were good. <laughs> uh, but I basically going to be talking a bit uh, about macro a lot, basically, because uh, we are going to be talking about a country that has serious, serious problems in its political equilibrium that drives to uh, a permanent situation of macroeconomic uh, disequilibria. And although in the long term, if the country is going to turn around, uh, has to solve many institutional and, and policy, many institutional and policy design issues, it, it's not gonna, none of that is going to happen if in the short run there's no some sort of stabilization, okay? And, and what I'm going to be talking is that the country is now in a trap in which it's very, very hard for political reasons to even achieve that, that stabilization. And 
And given that next year there's going to be a new government, it's, it's a good time to reflect about the previous eight years or 12 years and how that's going to uh, be uh, affecting what will happen in the next government. The main, but the main message I have is, is that at the end, um, oh, this country has been done very, very badly uh, for 50 years and relatively to the world very badly since the late 40s, early 50s. And that's a, a really a structural break in the country where the political equilibrium changed massively, and, and that's with the rise of Peronism. And there's a huge change there. Uh, gonna, but but, but uh, I'm not going to get into this long-term story, right? That, that's going to be too much for the time I have. The only thing I want to uh, to show you I come of this. Yeah, it's kind of a, this very nice figure where we have here the GDP per capita of Argentina in blue, and then an average of Australia, Canada, Germany, Spain, France, and United States. So we're arbitrary, but these countries are all rich. And at some point, they, got, they, ma they match, right? They were doing similar uh, in terms of their trends. And as I was saying, you know, with the rise of Peronists, there is a structural break here. And I will say that at that point, the country moved into populism. Uh, you may think, well, why the sudden the country could change that much into one point? Well, Jim will say there was a bit of bad opportunity there, but... But the, the truth is that the, the, this, this detention to get here has been accumulated since the crisis of 1930. The point is that there were no uh, elections uh, or clean elections over that period, right? So we see the emergence of that new political equilibrium that maybe was developing over 20 or, or 30 years at the point when essentially there is a gain uh, uh, an open election where no one is, is proscribed, where there's no electoral fraud, and 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 that that's the, where a substantial change uh, occurred. Actually, the institutional change started a bit before because in the in the military government before the uh, Perón is elected, Perón was the vice president and he was conducting many of the reforms that that government was doing. So. It is well documented that large institutional change happened in, it starts to happen in, in 1943. So I will say that this is the rise of populism in Argentina and that Argentina never exit this equilibrium. Uh, and what that I will characterize is an illiberal democracy, very low respect, right, for the division of power and institutions in the country. Uh, always manipulate, trying to be manipulated in favor of the of the populists when they are in power. Uh, a very close economy that was in autarky for many many decades and still is really close today. Um, that you can look at in one paper by me. Uh, path dependency for substitution policies where I develop like the political equilibrium and, and how the economy evolved following that. Uh, and corporatism, corporativism. Uh, and then again, uh, following some work by Shima and Daron, uh, in this paper, we model specifically why essentially uh, populist governments may, may create corporate, corporative organizations to defend in this uh, closed economy, right? So essentially, the idea is, okay, at some point, you know, we're not going to be in government, someone will change, so we will create organizations uh, that will defend this. And, and unions are extremely powerful in Argentina, and the reason they're extremely powerful, like, is the same reason everywhere in the world. Unions are power where they control resources. Well, in Argentina, they control 
a huge amount of resources because they man basically manage the health system of the country. So all formal workers uh, pay eight uh, percent per year of the eight percent per per year of their salary to contribute to this system that is mostly run by unions. Okay. Plus, they have other uh, economic activities. And so they, they are really a, a very strong organization that protects a closed economy uh, toward even, even today, and not only a closed economy, many other distorted policies. And then since the 70s, the country got into a very extreme volatility, a macroeconomic volatility uh, environment, right? And and that's uh, all I want to say about the long term. But it's clearly that and the country needs severe reforms to really uh, change course. And I, I'm not going to uh, be able to talk about all of that. But I want to just shift into, let's say, the period 2011 to, to today, right? Where I think it's a particular cycle uh, that is very interesting enough and that will allow me to make this uh, second big point that sometimes or many times uh, when people look at governments, they tend to analyze the government and its performance as if it were isolated from the political, from the political equilibrium that exists in the country, right? And I think that's a big mistake. And I think Argentina is an excellent example of that. Why I think it's, it's like, any like thinking about the blank state, right? We we, we don't have a blank state in, in in biologically. Well, here is the same. When you government, when you are in government, whatever you do uh, is going to uh, be responded by the private sector, depending what they expect about the future, right? So it. If from time to time a country that it's mostly been into the populist uh, equilibrium I mentioned before gets a reformist government, that reformist government could attempt reforms. But for, for the government to succeed, the reforms have to be credibly that they will be sustained over time. If they're not going to be sustained over time, essentially the reforms could be extremely costly because they are sort of destroying whatever is there, right? Because they are saying, well, we are changing the incentives. And the new the new activities that have to emerge will not respond because they don't, when they look forward, they say, well, there's a very high probability that uh, a populist government will come back. And if that's the case, uh, the reforms will be reverted. And then there was an attempt of reform in the country with a lot of problems, technical, but by the military government in the 70s, and, and all that ended up into really bad, a bad outcome, politically and, and economic. Uh, but they couldn't reform much, even though they have suppressed all the institutions, they have incarcerated union leaders, and... and they really have a very violent control of society. And still, they, they couldn't achieve much uh, if you compare to other military governments of the same period. Uh, that's especially striking. And then there was the 90s, where it's a, it's a special period because... Uh, so this is right after the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism around the world. So many countries move more into market-oriented reforms. Argentina also uh, does that under the leadership of a former populist uh, Peronist, which was President Menem, that essentially he realized that when he took government after a devastated hyperinflation, that he had to change the country or he was not going to be able to survive. He was really uh, not that ideological in that sense. He appointed uh, a very group of technocrats that conducted many important sort of market-oriented reforms. But the point is that at the end, that experiment ended up into a huge macroeconomic crisis. I'm not going to get again into the details, but in the, in the huge macroeconomic class, and what matters to us is that then 
this new form of Peronism, which is, I will label Kirchnerism because the leader was Kirchner, that is also extremely populist, and all those reforms get reverted. And not only that, I will show you they really uh, put the economy into, again, a very, very large disequilibrium situation, right? So I will be saying that at that point, the country had not yet reversed all the corporativist policies of Peronism, and then they got this new huge populist shock. And none of that is, is reversed yet. So the country is into really a very dis despair situation, okay? So the last attempt to do some reforms and transformation was by the Macri government, but this was a much weaker government politically. It was limited what they could do, and it opens a whole debate of how you should make alliances to try to reform this country into this political environment, okay? So I will want to talk about that too. Let me show you that, you know, this is a, a, a bipolar country, right? If the populists are in government, uh, the market will tell us this is going really bad, right? And so for example, in the in 2011, Christina Kirchner was the president. She was in, in her second term. She didn't have constitutionally a third term, but of course they always wanted to change the constitution, get a third term. In particular, she wanted to change the judicial system because she is accused of many cases of corruption. She and, and even now that she's vice president, her main objective is to remove the Supreme Court and to control the courts, right? And that is what I refer to a very low respect for, for institutions before. So in the midterm elections, uh, they, she was defeated, right? And so that anticipated that there was gonna be a change in the country, and we see that in, in the stock market, right? The stock market reflects how the market started to became to value Argentina more because th there was the possibility of uh, a more reasonable government. And after the uh, primaries in 2015, when, when it started to be seen that this Macri, uh, which was a more, uh, let's say, capitalist candidate and uh, um, more reformist candidate, he he basically, the markets uh, got to uh, think, uh, okay, there is a new window of opportunity to reform this country. Uh, then uh, Macri was in government, so uh, <coughs> government lasts for four years, midterm selections are in, two, uh, in the second year, and this is a very unstable country. So I will tell you right now that you can say the the Macri government did not, was not that successful economically, but I think in one sense it's extremely successful. And you will maybe laugh at this, but why is extremely successful? Because he finished. He finished his four years. That's very unusual. Uh, so some people will say that didn't happen for a non peronist government since uh, 1928. But not only he finished, he finished with 42% of the vote, which was the highest share of votes he got ever. So he didn't finish losing support. It's just that he never had that much of a support. Okay, I will get back to this. And why that's important? Because he started to open something that is not been seen before in Argentina is the possibility of alternancy. That's very important for democracy. And so the, the Macri's party won the midterm selection uh, two years after he lost the government, right? And that is constraining the, what the, the, the Kirchnerism can do in government right now, uh, although they could do a lot of disaster. But uh, institutionally, the fact that the government of Macri did not 
collapsed and also was strong after the election when he was not reelected, allowed the, the party to stay uni, united, the coalition, let's say, the coalition to stay united and to really be uh, a constraint what uh, populism can do. But you see, this is when Macri mid, lost the midterm, uh, the sort of, he, it's not that he lost the, the primaries, but the primaries are weird in Argentina. They, they are like a, a big poll because voting is mandatory for the whole population. So it's like a preview of what's going to happen in the election. He didn't do well, and the markets collapsed just in one day. Right. This was on a Sunday. The Monday, uh, the value of assets went down sixty percent. Sixty percent, right? And so that's essentially what the market think. Oh, the populists are, are are going to be back. This country is worth a lot less tomorrow. Okay, and that's governing under the shadow of, popula of, of populism. Because when Macri was trying to improve the economy. And, and for example, was trying to foster the production of energy. Investor came and said, "Well, but what if you don't win the midterm ele election against Christina Kirchner, that she was candidate? If that, if if Macri will have lost the mid that midterm election, probably this will have happened two years before, and maybe he will not even have finished his term, right? So, so that's why it's so complicated to govern in this country." Let me show you a bit more, right? So what happened in the last four years of Kirchner is, in, well, inflation was going up, and even though they were really uh, constraining all the big prices of the economy, what, what do I mean by that? They were keeping the price of energy, transport, subsidized, heavily subsidized, so that they didn't affect prices, and also the price of the exchange rate they have uh, an official exchange rate and a black market where the black market was much higher, uh, but they still they get inflations of the 40% uh, level. So inflation was all going up and GDP per capita was completely stagnant. So that's kind of the a scenario in which Macri uh, took over. And then I tell you, they leave the economy in a state of despair, right? So essentially, they leave the economy with a very large fiscal deficit, like this is kind of 7% for the national, but then if you add the provinces, it's 8%, and that matters. Uh, it's, you know, you have to, this is not a country that can finance a lot of the deficit accumulating very large levels of debt. There's not that much confidence in the market, so you have to adjust that very fast, right? So I will say that, if you want to succeed, you need to adjust the deficit in two years or so. If you don't do that, you will be uh, probably probably in trouble. And you know, it's very difficult to make a fiscal adjustment of that order of magnitude. It's very unpopular. And uh, you will be cutting it is you will be cutting somehow benefits. Uh, that some groups are are, are showing. The, the other problem is that part, a large part of the expenditures are done by the uh, local governments. And the federal government doesn't have a direct control of that, couldn't mandate anything. <clears throat> and so if they, if they don't cut expenditures, it's very hard to really uh, reduce also the very high tax pressure of the country, and hence it's very high to attract capital, right? And then it's very hard to grow, and you get the vicious circle. So uh, you see, uh, at the end, uh, so the government reduced the deficit. I will here show you some better figures, because essentially the other thing that they happened with the Kirchner is they, they always get the uh, some uh, lies in the official statistics, right? So this deficit was larger once you take into account many of the things they, they were not taking into account. Let me tell you, for example, uh, for example, they were not paying part of the debt. And so the inter those interests are not here, but obviously when Macri took over, I started to, to pay the whole debt and things like that, okay? But 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 so so there is a reduction of four points of of the deficit and and a reduction of more than six points in expenditure. So that's a very large adjustment that Macri did. All that has been reverted. All that has been reverted uh, in the last four years. 
for example, last year deficit, this, this is, is underestimated in 1.4 points. So it's now 5%. So probably they will leave a deficit well measured that is again sort of very high, 6%. So again, the government, next government, but will have to face a very large fiscal adjustment. And you see, this is striking. This is so when Kirchner took over, the total expenditures in the country were at 25%. Maybe you can say 28 was the long-term equilibrium. They leave it with 44% in these figures, in other figures, 42. You know, they say an increase of 15, 17 points of GDP. That's it's enormous. I don't know if you really realize. But that is like having one state and almost putting another state. And then you have to finance that. And, and once you cannot finance, how do you go back from this expenditure? Especially, let me tell you, they also increased tax revenue with very distorted tax, right? They were moving into the worst kind of taxes just to try to get a bit more and a bit more. And, and they were far away from financing the deficit, okay? Uh, but the point is that where they increase or where uh, public expenditure was increased, well, salaries 4%, public salaries. But a lot of this is in the local government, so it's hard for the national government to really reverse this. Four points is just pensions. They gave pensions to people that don't contribute. I'm not saying that government should not have some sort of non-contributory pensions, but those should be special programs, well targeted, and, and, the, and the contribution should not be similar to the ones that contribute. Otherwise, no one has incentive to, to contribute, right? Uh, so, so this is anyway, once they are given, you cannot take away the pensions from the people. It's not, it's not legal, but it's also politically un unviable, right? So, so there's no way to undo this easily. There's very little for the national government to undo this. And then they were subsidizing energy and transport. You, you can undo this, but that is very unpopular because that means that you will charge energy and transport at its cost. And, and that, that was, uh, they were charging like 10% of the cost. So you can imagine what, this adjustment has to be. And, and so the, the market administration has spent several years adjusting this. Um, not, naturally, that, that was not that popular, right? Uh, okay, what the, what the government did, the new Kirchnerist government did in between 19 and today, they undo all this, right? And now most of the deficit is again the subsidies. And yesterday, they, pay, they passed in the Congress a new moratorium to give uh, new pensions for non, non people that did not contribute that's gonna cost 0 0.5 of GDP per year, right? So, so you, you, again, I don't want to, it's not about the details, it's about giving you the picture of how essentially we, you have a government that tries to order, put some order in the economy to try to sort of offer a place for where investment comes occurred and so other reforms can be done over time and, and hence move this society into a better place and but it's under the shadow of the return of this government and 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 that posed serious constraints okay, i'm not going to get because of time into detail for everything but they get, they leave the central bank broken without reserves uh, and this is the energy subsidies I was saying, which is which are very, uh, in a way, regressive. You end up subsidizing rich people here, right? Uh, indeed, the very poor people, for example, they don't, they are not connected to gas, so they don't get these the subsidies. Uh, and and because you distort all these prices, then uh, the country that has as one of its natural resources, energy, end up importing energy instead of exporting energy, right? It's all distorted. They distort the real estate rate. So immediately when, when the market arrives, has to make a devaluation, uh, and that will accelerate inflation, okay? So fine, the, you, you get the picture that when Macri took over, 
he basically had a destroyed economy in the short run and a very bad uh, political equilibrium, right? Through which he has to do the reform. So in that context, uh, he was a, he was a weak government, right? He was the weakest since the return to democra democracy uh, in '83. He has a minority in uh, he did, he doesn't have a quorum in any of the chambers, right? So it's very difficult to pass important reforms in that context, especially with the Kirchnerists will not negotiate anything. They will just go against everything you want to do, right? It doesn't matter whether. At some point, they like it, that or not. That one example is uh, the government, the Macri administration signed this Mercosur uh, European market trade agreement that the Kirchner were also trying to sign. Once it was signed by the Macri, they said, we're not going to vote uh, positively in Congress, right? Even, even though it was a policy, they didn't, they, they pursued themselves. Right, so why also electorally, Macri was not really that strong uh, and a strong candidate. So when there were the presidential elections in 2015, he was the second runner with 34% of the vote, okay? And then uh, Scioli, the, which was the, the Kirchner candidate, got 37% of the vote. I want you to remember this, this name to Massa, Massa, he was a former Kirchnerist, right? He was chief chief cabinet of Nestor Kirchner, but then they have a fight, so he was run under a more modern Peronist version. He got 21% of the vote. And that's the reason why Macri ended up winning the election, because then he got into the ballotage. And in the second, the second round, he got 51% against 49%. So it was a very marginal victory, right? So... Why Macri, in spite of the economic problems and, and many good things his government did, many, many, it was a really honest government. Uh, there's no uh, uh, accusations of, of corruptions in courts. I mean, uh, it, it was very transparent. It achieved many things uh, in, in areas, even in economics, but in, in other areas. I will say more, more. Uh, but but he did, he was not reelected not because he did much worse. As I say, he got forty two percent of the vote at the end. But because then Massa went back to uh, go with the Kirchner, and they got forty eight. And Argentina has a very weird ballotage system that if you get more than forty five. You are elected. You don't need to get fifty, and that was because when the the reform was uh, the constitution was reformed, Menem wasn't sure he did the reform, so he could be reelected. <laughs> he wasn't sure he could get fifty percent, so he wanted forty five to be sure. Right? <laughs> very very uh, very good way to design institutions, right? <laughs> anyway, so. In this situation, right, where there was a no a clear mandate, also there's not a clear mandate because although the Kirchner lived a very uh, disadjusted economy, it was not be perceived by the population that way, right? There, there was no a macro explosion. It was not like that they had a huge devaluation because they were sort of containing the dollar, losing all the reserves of the central bank, even selling future, right? They were selling 10,000 billion future just to contain the dollar, which will be illegal in my view, because you are selling the assets of the state at a very low price, given the market, but it's, it's considered okay. Um, so so they managed to not, so they managed to get without the economy really uh, have to make uh, the nominal adjustment, and that all came into Macri in the first year, right? And here, here there is the hard choices, right? First, you are really weak, so if you cannot do very serious structural reform, it's very difficult to undo all this, all this, very all the more structural sources of the problem, right? You can go through a better macro uh, macro policy, try to e reduce expenditure somehow, uh, but but 
it's not with, with, without structural reform, right? like a pension reform and you know, things like that, uh, it's very hard to do it. Plus, if you try to go that very, very fast with the adjustment in the first two years, you you you, you are under the risk of losing the midterm elections, right? So, and if you go through something middle through, maybe you do okay in the midterm election, but you are very at the very risk of if a shock happened, right? Uh, you you didn't do the adjustment yet, and and that's and that's what ended up happening. Uh, all right, let's say all that. So there were also, in my way, view some mistakes in the first year of government. One is that it relates to incentives, right? The central bank wanted to reduce inflation very fast, going from 36% in 2016 to 5% in 2019. Of course, someone will say, Look, if we don't print money, we can achieve it. But the point is, how can you not print money in a government that is subject to uh, the possibility of uh, running a default, right? And and so uh, that's a big discussion among macro, whether you, you could make the central bank independent as an institution, irrespective of whatever is going in an economy, and others that tend to internalize the political constraints and think, oh, okay, you can try to do it, but there are certain states of nature in which that's not gonna be the equilibrium, okay? And, and that happens too in the, during Macri's term. Uh, and also in 2016, there were a couple of fiscal measures that went into the wrong direction. And one was uh, that they, they reduced taxes uh, maybe in the wrong way. I'm not saying that the, we needed a tax reform, uh, but we needed to really address the most distorted taxes. That was part of my work, and we passed a very large reform in 2017. Uh, but, but in 2016, they really uh, sort of reduced the income tax uh, which is not the one that you have to reduce. And that was part of the political equilibrium, right? It's, it's not what the government wanted to do, but it's what you end up coming out from Congress, okay? And they were trying to fix some problems in the tax, but they couldn't get uh, what they wanted, and they end up having a large cut in the taxes. All that hit us in uh, when, I, when I moved to government in, in 2017, not in 2016, and they also pass like a, a, a recognition of the fact that the pensioners were not paying pensioners what they were supposed to be paid, and that cost like more than one point of GDP without passing a tax a pension reform. And again, the most urgent thing about the pension reform was the formula of adjustment that was completely uh, inconsistent with stabilizing the economy, and we. That was part of what I worked to, and we passed that in 2017. Now, you know, passing a reform in Argentina is not easy, and here I have another show. This is what happened when we were passing, here is the Congress here, and this is the people attacking Congress against a reform. That was pretty much protecting the pensioners, because it's moving from a formula that adjusts by wages and, and tax revenues to one that mostly adjusts by inflation, right? And so it protects, protects pensioners when inflation accelerates, but this is what happens since then. So pensioners will have been much better with the formula we, we proposed. But we were doing because in part that the previous formula has a very, very large lag for adjustment. And that means that if you wanted to reduce inflation, expenditures were going up substantially because of the lag, right, well, in real terms. And also because if you adjust by wages and taxes, if you think in a steady state, wages and taxes will grow with GDP. So essentially pensions will grow with GDP. You never decrease, even, no matter how much you grow, right? And so you could, we could never decrease expenditures. We wanted to really fix it in real terms. So the, the growth of the economy will reduce the burden of all those pensions that were really given before, okay? Uh, 
anyway, so as I say, we, we, the, at the end, uh, there was a, a large adjustment in the economy. So for example, private expenditures were reduced in four years, almost seven points. Some taxes were reduced too. Uh, and the primary balance is reduced. So, so there's almost primary equilibrium when Macri finishes term, right? At the end was 0 0.4, not zero. Zero was what uh, forecast, but then in the last two, three months, there was an increase in expenditure when, because of electoral uh, motivation and also in the last months when the Kirchner took over, okay? But then the economy didn't do as well. So if you have this was the bump in inflation of the Kirchner, that's the bump in inflation when Macri leaves the fixed exchange rate. Then the inflation was going down, and then the, the economy has, in my view, bad luck. What is bad luck in Argentina is something common, unfortunately. Uh, uh, this is a draw. Argentina is the main pro produce, producer of soybeans, and that's the main export. And, and natural resources are among the most important exports. And there's a big draw, and there's a huge drop in production. That normally needs a devaluation, right? It means you are producing less tradable goods. The equilibrium exchange rates goes up, and that will also tend to uh, foster inflation. Plus, there was a sudden stop to the emerging markets, you see it uh, here, Argentina was still needing uh, to take debt to be able to keep inflation going down because essentially the deficit was larger than what the central bank was financing to have the, the inflation they wanted to have. So, so, so what happened here, maybe you don't remember, but essentially people started to think around March, April, that the Fed was going to increase the, the interest rate. Then it didn't happen, but, but by then it was too late for Argentina, right? They, the market's closed for Argentina, and Argentina has to sign a credit with the IMF. Now, once you sign a credit with the IMF, all becomes about that. You are a traitor to the country, and then the good people is the ones that don't sign the credit with the IMF. Even though, and, and the whole discussion is like this in the country, you indebted the country because of the uh, credit with the IMF. And the only reason you all know that the country will increase its debts is because it has a deficit. And the deficit was inherited, and all the market did was to reduce the deficit. So if something, the country ended up taking less debt than it should have taken with the deficit that was uh, inherited. But particularly in terms of the IMF uh, uh, loan, that increased nothing the debt, because in the last, last two years in dollars, the debt didn't increase. It was only used to essentially roll out the debt with the private sector that Argentina lost access to, okay? So, How much time do I have left? 50 minutes, let me. Uh, so now with the governing power, you know, they destroyed everything. Uh, I did, I, I work a lot on this pension, on, on this sort of the change of the formula. They move back to the explosive formula. So now the new government, if they want to stabilize the economy, they will have to change the formula again. There's no way you can stabilize with that formula. They, we did a tax reform that was a working plan, right? It was uh, going to be implemented in five years, and it was going to cost more or less 0.3 per year uh, of GDP, which was not a lot, and it has some ways to escape in some taxes if things didn't go that well, and that's uh, what ended up happening. But but the, the nice thing that it was part of a deal that we, we cut with the provinces, with the local, with the governors, which is very unusual in Argentina to have one agreement like that, in which essentially we agreed to a, a fiscal responsibility law, which says the governments cannot increase the primary expenditure. Right, over than inflation, only can adjust by inflation. So the idea was okay. 
the national government cannot really reduce all the expenditures in the province, but if we, at least we can keep it fixed and the economy grows, then we can start to restore to lower levels of expenditure, and then we can sustain this tax system that we are created over five years, okay? And the idea of having a law that legislate the tax reform, even though it was gonna be implemented very gradually over five years, was okay, firms could sort of, if they are look forward, they could internalize that. But obviously, if they when they look forward, they see the return of Kirchner, they rightly will know that this reform will be changed. And that's what ended up happening. The reform was, was changed. The first, the first thing that the new government did was to suppress the fiscal responsibility law so everyone could increase expenditures again, okay? Uh, so expenditures are, are back. And, and how the economy did? Well, it keeps doing badly, right? GDP keeps going down and inflation now is growing at a really explosive rate. So, so now what is gonna happen is that if, the, if a new government arrives uh, that wants it to be reformist, it's going to have to do this in a much worse, uh, in some sense, much worse macroeconomic scenario. Why? Because now we have 12 years of no growth or even decline. And that is, is really something that makes the population very uh, intolerant to fiscal adjustment. Second, uh, inflation is now at a new level, right? It's not at the level of between 25 and 40 that was in the previous cycle. Now it's up, going to be about 100% this year. Um, and, and that's uh, basically uh, gonna be key to reduce for the new government. But, you know, reducing inflation with a large deficit, again, is not simple. So the new government will have to make very hard choices to achieve that because the fiscal deficit will be, again, very large and all the energy and transport will be heavily subsidized again, okay? So, so the, what is the discussion right now in the country? Well, is okay, what, what was wrong in the market administration? And, and I think one of the points that they, they are being discussed is the, the following, right? And I, th I don't think you have a, an easy answer, but I think it's what divides the opposition, the, 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 the Macri's coalition right now. Is uh, some people say, well, maybe we, we should have made an agreement with Massa, even before 2015, put it inside the coalition, him and keep him inside. That will have increased the chances of re-election and will have made, pro maybe, more likely to make reforms. And other people say, well, but if we want to really reform the country, we cannot ally with the populists, right? And, and that maybe to, it's hard to answer this question because uh, I will have, by, by principle, I think that nothing has worked in Argentina, so maybe we don't. Maybe we have to think that let's do the right thing. And I, I think that if I say the most important achievement of Macri's government was to finish, the most achieve the most important achievement of the next democratic reformist government should be to be reelected, because then we may open a new window, right? Maybe we, the the window that okay now we have. A, go, a, a coalition that is most responsive to institutions, the division of power, the, and who wants to integrate the economy to the world, and he wants to start to dismantle all of this populist equilibrium. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because it's not the, the, that equilibrium is not only, as I said at the beginning, about uh, it's not only about. The Kirchnerism. I think that will be a mistake to think it is just. The, yeah, of course, the Kirchner have very bad ideas, but but the point is that they get voted, and they get voted by a very large fraction of the population. So a large fraction of population is not dissatisfied with these policies. I would, if you look at the polls today, I mean, they may may still get into into a ballotage, even even with this really bad set of outcomes, 
right? Let alone all the other uh, bad outcomes institutionally that they are uh, achieving, right? Like trying to remove the Supreme Court or the way they handled the, the pandemic, which was really, really bad. Uh, so, so there is still a large support and that goes to the second layer. So I think that this country will have a shot if the Kirchner's are really defeated electorally. So there is a hope that the, that investor may think that the new government has a, a much wider horizon and then and the new government managed to stabilize the economy, which is going to be difficult. It's not simple. If the, the new government doesn't stabilize, it doesn't matter if the Kirchner doesn't do well in the election, because anyway, they, there's going to be a new figure from the populist side that will start to emerge as a possible successful candidate in, in, in the next presidential election, and the shadow of populism will be there anyway, okay? And uh, Finally, I think the country needs a bit of, of good luck, right? It needs good terms of stories. Whatever we aim for this economy in the next four years, still will produce soybean and still will produce gas. And if the terms of trade goes down, well, that's that's really hard because it reduces uh, uh, the wealth in the short run. That's reduced demand. That's reduced growth in the short run. And uh, it needs uh, a further devaluation, right? And so that is in a context in which you have to reduce inflation for 100% is problematic. I, I guess that I, I finish, right? I say at the end, the problem is political. And I, it is my view that every time you see an economy doing really bad for many, many decades, it cannot be that they don't get the good economic policies. Of course, there are mistakes, right? I was very uh, open to say, yeah, there were some mistakes. But I think without without the shocks of 2008, maybe Macri could have been reelected. And, and that could have been a different story. But, but those shocks happen and will happen again. Right now, there is a draw this year, a very severe draw this year again, right? So, um, and sudden stops also happen, so, but also the level of debt has increased so much, so that makes things more difficult for the next government. Probably they won't have enough time to adjust. So if they have to make a large adjustment fast, people will not be that supporting, and that will open the question of what's going to happen politically to that goal. Okay? It's, a, it's a big trap in which the country is. You have to reform from disaster in, in two years and not lose the midterm elections. Right? It's very, very challenging. Thank you.